So okay, hello everyone. So we were last time discussing uh, optical lithography tricks, right? How we can improve the resolution of the system by doing some adjustments. And uh, one was <clears throat> the last time what we discussed was uh, optical proximity correction. Uh, people have learned from their experiments that. Um, features on the edges and corners they develop differently than what you expect especially the features which are on the corners they are etched a little bit more or they are developed more and um, and so the, those features are rounded and then because they are developed a little bit more then you ended up getting actually a little bit smaller feature than what you expect and then and also in the corners um, the development is lesser. There is a rounding effect, but again, the development is lesser than what your mask says. So based on that, people now actually uh, include some proximity correction features. For example, if there is a scare, uh, there is a, a corner or a rectangular shape, so we know that it will be edged more and it will be circular or rounded after the development. So we put a small, another small feature, we call it an OPC feature, <coughs> optical proximity correction. So after development, um, even after a little bit more development, you ended up getting actually the feature what you want. And in the corners, um, you, the red uh, feature shows that there is nothing there in a mask. So you ended up having less development in that area, but still because you started with a smaller area of so the, the corner would be very similar to what you were expecting. So by doing it, um, you can improve the resolution, especially when you are working at a um, nanoscale. Uh, for example, with the F2 laser, with the deep ultraviolet, uh, without these features, you would expect something 150 nanometer. But by doing these adjustments, you can actually go up to 100 nanometer. There is another very important uh, method and uh, which can be used for uh, improving the resolution of a system that's that's by using a uh, phase shift masks so what happens in a regular transmission mask so for example this is your mask where you have a chrome feature so dark area shows that it's opaque here so light will not pass through it and when you have exposure so you expect that light will pass through the transparent regions, right? And then the dark regions will not allow the uh, electromagnetic waveform or light to pass through. So uh, ideally, you are expecting this kind of uh, exposure. But in reality, I told you that you have a bell-shaped uh, exposure, right? So in this region, you will have this bell-shaped with the secondary loops. And also in this region, you have another bell shape the scanner loops and you know that these bell shaped if they are very close to one another they will not uh, these two features if they're very close they will not develop properly so if we just look at this example in this case you will see that okay this is separate but there there so this is the intensity here and the intensity here so they will add up so you the resultant exposure would be something like that so this area would be maximum exposed but the area in between which is this area which should not be exposed actually that's also getting some exposure so you will end up getting not a nice feature so by using a phase shift mask so those masks are designed such that the any nearby features we put a phase shifter there so phase shifter actually shift the phase of the waveform of light which is passing through there so what happens when you see it on the when you look at your exposure so your exposure so in this case, it's the phase shifted. Uh, so you are exposed to intensity or energy at the wafer. Uh, from this side, it will be similar as before. But on this side, because you are shifting a phase, you will have this kind of exposure downwards. And you will see in this case, now there will be a destructive interference happening at this point because you are inverting a phase of the light. And uh, on the wafer surface, the intensity or power, which is the transferred power unit area, uh, would be like this. So basically your I, which is your intensity or power transferred, is directly proportional to your inner magnitude of energy. Okay, so I, 
which is intensity, is directly proportional to magnitude of energy square. So not really, so in this case, we are again neglecting a phase because we are looking at the magnitude. So at the end, because you're looking at the magnitude, you will be getting this kind of uh, exposure where you have a, a maximum exposure where you want it to be. And then there, because of a destructive interference, you will be getting a very low exposure at this point and then a high exposure again. So by doing it, by using a phase shifter in nearby features, you can uh, apply destructing interference at the border and you can end it up very nice features on the surface. So now you can see that this area will be very uniformly exposed and this area uh, would not be exposed. So you can have two features very nearby by doing it, just by doing it. <clears throat> what is I? I? Uh, is the power transferred or intensity of the waveform. Yeah, e is energy. E is energy, yes. So I is equal to magnitude of energy scale, yeah. OK? Uh, Okay, now let's talk about, okay, this is what we were mostly with the G-line, I-line lithography of our deep ultraviolet. But then when we talk about the next generation lithography, so where we are actually printing features, next generation means uh, what has been done recently or what people will be doing in near future. So all these technologies come under the umbrella of next generation because either they are under development or they are just developed, and but it requires a lot of improvement. So the first one is, so we'll go through these technologies one by one later on, but uh, briefly, uh, the first one is extreme UV, like uh, deep UV. So this is extreme UV, so you are using a waveform which has a lambda of, or a wavelength of about 40 nanometer, one to 40. <clears throat> so, and we also called that extreme UV as a soft X-ray. So harder X-rays are the ones uh, which even have actually 0.1 uh, nanometer of wavelength of light, so very high frequency. So soft X-ray is defined as anything from 1 to 40 nanometer wavelength of light. But that also brings a lot of cost because you have to design a masks which are even the regular masks cannot work with these uh, high frequency wavelengths because the masks are made up of uh, um, quartz and uh, and if we calculate the energy of uh, this high frequency is equal to CO lambda and lambda is really really small so you'll be getting a very high uh, energy dissipation in the quartz so your quartz will cannot work with this one so you need a very really expensive mask with the new materials and you cannot use a reflect you have to use the reflective optics as we discussed previously. Uh, there is a, another uh, lithography technique, it's called the proximal extra lithography. So basically, uh, in that case, we further reduce the wavelength of light. Those, these systems are commercially available, but they are very expensive. So the wavelength of light in a harder X-ray is about 0.1 nanometer. Okay, so then, so these are mostly in electromagnetic waves like the light. But then we also use an electron beam or focus ion beam. So when you say electron beam, it means uh, electrons are coming and hitting the surface and exposing your wafer. And ions means you have a small ions. It can be gallium ions or uh, uh, some other ions which can hit on the surface. You can control the exposure. So the E-beam, uh, we briefly call it as an E-beam lithography, electron beam lithography. So it's a very, very commonly used equipment, by the way. <clears throat> so you have a very focused beam of uh, electrons which you focus on certain area, very small area, so it's really focused and you can expose the area very specifically. You can have features about, uh, in this case, you can have features about sub 10 nanometers, means uh, with electron beam lithography you can print things 10 nanometer or even smaller, okay? but. Uh, the regular system which we found in an academia environment, you can achieve a resolution of about 50 nanometer, but if you are working in an industry, you would be able to achieve sub 10 nanometer with the E-beam lithography. So you use the E-beam resist for this case. And secondly, because now you are really focusing your electron beam in a very small area, so this is a very low throughput process. Uh, that's a one major limitation of the any serial lithography system. 
any serial like atomic force microscopy or atomic force microscopy based lithography where you really want to write features it's like electron pen so you have a pen which is a very small tip like a focused electron beam and you can only write a very small edit one time so let's say if you have such a big wafer and you have a lot of features on the surface then uh, then it will uh, maybe require a couple of days to actually write one wafer so which which is not practical for uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for for commercial use, but we still use it for a lot of applications. So, how do you think we can still use the such a cell system when you make uh, computers and uh, computer chips, right? So, eBeam is also used at certain processes. So, how do you think we should be able to use such a slow system, uh, but with a high throughput requirement? Can we have maybe multiple electron beams or what? Yes. You use it for like very specific things that need the very fine focus, but not the whole wafer. That's correct. So the reason is we, we don't require 10 nanometer everywhere. I told you, right? The technologies we work with, the only few features are really important, and those should be in nanometer or really small, but not the whole thing. So some source and drain and gate region. So gate might be you need a very small gate, but other things are still larger. So you only write the features which require a super high resolution with the E-beam, only those areas, and not the whole wafer. So you can still use the optical lithography or X-ray lithography based on your requirement, whatever you want to print. And then with the small features, you can use the E-beam because the wafer can have multiple exposures. So you can cover it, you can do a second exposure, you can cover it, you can do a third exposure. For the E-beam, because you're really focusing on a small area, do you think we would require a mask? No, we don't need a mask. It's just like, a, have you ever used a 3D printer? <clears throat> in a 3D printer, whatever design you give it to the printer, then it starts printing like that, right? So you control the motor where it goes. So in that way, in the e-beam lithography system, there is a small software which normally comes with the system, or it is also compatible with AutoCAD or SolidWorks or some other types of softwares, where you design your mask that what you want, and you define the location where you are, right? Uh, so you align your wafer with uh, electron beam gun. So you first define, okay, where you are, and from there, you then calculate the respective distances where you want that feature to be. And then this electron gun goes there and start writing there only, okay? So directly on the surface of a wafer. But yes, there is a resist which is used. Uh, it's called E-beam resist, which is different. PMMA is a one type, so there are quite a few types available. So those resists are sensitive to uh, the electron uh, exposure. Uh, so what electron does, actually, it also transfers the energy uh, to that photoresist in certain localized area. And then one, after that, you also need to develop it. So it breaks the polymer chains in small area. And once you develop it, then you have uh, that feature printed on there. And it is very nice resolution. I myself use it for making electrodes of 100 nanometer. Uh, so, and uh, it was very repeatable. But it takes some time to actually learn the tricks. There's also, and, and the same way you can also use the ions um, to really etch small areas. Uh, some people use ions actually if there is uh, some defects in the mask which you have. People use these tools also to uh, fix those defects also because you can really go into a nanoscale and you can fix those defects. But again, the ion beam can be used for making holes, or small holes for different applications. And uh, <clears throat> and then uh, it, it can also be used for uh, localized deposition. If you want a certain material to be deposited in a certain area, very localized, so the ion beam, you can focus the beam in a certain area and the chamber has to be, has to fill with a gas which can wreck with the surface and um, and uh, make a layer. We will cover the deposition techniques later, but basically you can go anywhere and you can deposit a very, very selective material, uh, specifically at the nanoscale with the, by using the ion beam. And you can also write it on the surface with the ion beam, anything, because it will etch away the surface. <clears throat> and, but again, it's also a serial method, so it's very time consuming. 
So these electron and um, focus ion beams are also used in a uh, projection format. Um, means uh, instead of focusing them directly, so you project them. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so you project them uh, in different directions through the uh, through a mask. So basically, uh, you try to increase the throughput by having a more exposure. But then in that case, you have to use a mask, and that's tricky to design. Uh, but not commonly used equipment. There are other techniques called the proximal probe lithography. Uh, when you say proximal probe, it's uh, also it means you have a probe, like electron beam, you have a beam which is focused on a small area. In a proximal probe, basically it means the atomic force microscopy or atomic force microscopy based uh, lithography. So what atomic force microscopy means that it's called the AFM in simple words. So AFM, the equipment operates such that so you have a very nanoscale small tip of a certain material. So your tip is nanoscale. And with that tip, you can go to certain area, okay? And then you can write it with that tip physically. And you can do many things with the AFM. But basically the idea is that you can have a small tip, you can go a certain area and you can write it. You can erase features with the AFM. And uh, let's say if we have certain features on the surface and you want to image things, the AFM can go there. The tip is flexible, so it doesn't break very easily. Okay, so but once it touches the tip, <clears throat> tip touches the surface, then you scan the surface where the features are high, so tip raises, then features are low, it falls, then like a profilometer. So you profile the surface, and based on how high and low it goes, it generates the uh, image. Uh, pattern of what it sees. Okay, it cannot distinguish between. Uh, okay, regular AFM cannot really distinguish between different materials, but it can g give you very good profile information. Okay, and from there you can generate. Uh, you can generate very nice images. For example, if you have a virus on the surface, if you have any proteins or even DNA, if you scan it, you should be able to see some features. Uh, it has very high resolution because of a tip is really, really small. And if tip is moving, and then you, you can now understand that if you put an AFM on this table, it will not work because of the vibrations which we have in our environment. So the AFM normally is put on a very nice uh, isolation table. We call it isolation. So we it has a certain cushions, uh, air cushions. So, so if there are some minor vibrations because of... Uh, some noise or some movement in the building, uh, then uh, then that would not affect your imaging. Otherwise, if things are vibrating, especially at a high resolution, or nanoscale vibrations, it will be useless to really image something in nanoscale because the vibration itself will produce a lot of noise. I have used this system. Actually, it works very well if you use it properly. But it's a very good technique. And now think about it. You have a lot of capabilities. Uh, that you can do with the nanoscale tip. So you can do many things. You can um, check if any protein is binding with the other protein by just taking one protein, put it there on the other protein. So you can move things at a nanoscale. And uh, and we'll see quite a few applications uh, a little bit later. We can use certain, people have used certain inks, which they connected with the pin, like you write a, with a pen, so you, which, is, which has a ink compartment in that way this nanoscale tip can have some ink. The ink can be made up of any polymers. It can be made up of any organic molecules like a DNA, like proteins. And you can actually write it on the surface or make patterns on the surface. If you want to functionalize a very small area, let's say if I want to functionalize a circle on the surface for some reason, 10 nanometer diameter, I can do it with AFM. Okay. Otherwise, it will be very hard to locally functionalize that area. <clears throat> so it, can, uh, it finds a lot of applications. Uh, in a one of our previous when I was teaching this course, uh, I think like last year, uh, there was one student who was working in a company, in, uh, I forgot the name of the company, um, in Delray, and uh, so their company, what they does is they just work with the AFM mostly, and they were fixing the, uh, so their company actually provides services to big companies, IBM and all those uh, people. So they have very expensive masks, so when you use a mask over a large period of time, um, some of the masks can get damaged, and so so they were actually fixing the masks only. 
and uh, and and mostly with the AFM. So let's say if your two lines are getting connected because of some debris or something, so the AFM you can go there and you can scratch the radio at nanoscale. So you can fix the mask. Otherwise, the mask would be very expensive. So yeah, it, you you can have many different applications, and people have actually also used uh, AFM for mirroring the local elastic modulus or mechanical properties of a material so let's say if you have a cell and you want to measure if it's flexible or not or any other material which is flexible or not uh, you can go there you can push it and, uh, and so it has those features so you can really push that and see uh, how much stiff the material is based on the bending of the tip of AFM and the bending can be detected with the diodes uh, with the laser which will uh, um, go through it later but for now I think it's okay to just give you some overview that it can have some various applications there's another technique is called the soft lithography very commonly used uh, for making microfluidic and nanofluidic devices we call this soft lithography uh, because the material which is used to transfer patterns are soft uh, very commonly used material is a PDMS. PDMS is a polymer, which is transparent, um, it's sort of flexible. So in soft lithography, what it means is that if you have a feature on the surface, and then you can use those features to make more features like embossing. So you really have nano or micro scale features, and you then put another polymer, you just press it on the surface at a certain temperature, and uh, conditions so then your features are really embossed or printed inside physically and then carefully then you remove it right so you can think about if you're printing features on a layer if you remove it then uh, there will be a lot of sticking or adhesion because of uh, uh, maybe hydrogen bonding or uh, wonder world forces so those things come into play but then you actually make your surface less adhesive with the with the mask which you're using to print it or with the, your master which you're using to print it so in that way, but it's a very high throughput technique. So you have a one master which can be used to print many more features. So you can just print it for some time, maybe a couple of minutes, and then remove it. If the pattern is with the transfer pattern is good, then it means you can have many patterns after that. And this is very very commonly used technique, with, especially in the microfluidics. And uh, that have quite a few applications. So nano imprint lithography is very similar to soft lithography, but uh, but in this case, uh, in soft lithography, we normally don't use the temperature and pressure, but in nano imprint lithography, we apply a certain temperature and pressure also and to to make sure, and then we also use some resist on the surface of a wafer, so that allows uh, very similar to soft lithography that allows the pattern to be transferred at a nano scale resolution so um, that's a very important technique very new uh, not really new actually it has been out there since a couple of years now mm, i know the fiu also have one nano printer at their facility in case if you really want to see it you can go and visit them maybe uh, but yes so these are in general techniques which are used at nano scale to make uh, features on nano scale so but let's look at the device processing how it looks like so for example we have uh, this uh, silicon Wafer, we oxidize it, <clears throat> we can put a photoresist, okay, and then we put a mask, so that's what we did before, right? And uh, then we expose it, then it will take off the photoresist, then uh, then we can transfer pattern actually to the bottom layer, right? So how we can transfer that pattern from the photoresist to the silicon dioxide layer? With etching, like use some chemical or gas mixture which can etch specifically or remove or wreck specifically with the silicon dioxide, but not with the photoresist. So if you use that kind of a chemical or gas, if it is a chemical liquid form, we call that as a wet etching. And if it is a gaseous form, we call it as a dry etching, okay? So those processes can be used to actually transfer pattern from your photoresist, which is a polymer, into a glass surface, which is actually silicon dioxide. So that pattern will be very, very stable because glass is very, very stable. Now, with the silicon dioxide, <clears throat> if you transfer pattern in silicon dioxide, do you remember what liquid chemical we can use to add silicon dioxide in this case? We have discussed that in the last class. <clears throat> 
So what, huh? HF. HF, yes, hydrofluoric acid. So we did talk about a hydrofluoric acid quite a uh, few minutes. So basically HF reacts with the silicon dioxide. And I, I mentioned that we cannot store it in a glass bottles and all that, right? Because it reacts with the glass. So HF is very selective in reacting with the silicon dioxide. It doesn't react with the silicon. It doesn't react with the polymer or photoresist. So that's a good chemical to HF silicon dioxide. If I put this wafer in HF, it will take off the silicon dioxide from this area. So, and then you can remove your uh, photoresist from the surface and the pattern can be transferred. Okay, let's say now you have open area. So this is actually open area. Okay, where there was silicon dioxide. Now the pattern is in silicon dioxide. Now we can actually, um, remember if we build a transistor, so what three terminals transistor has? It has gate and source and drain. And source and drain are actually either N-type or P-type, okay? We'll not go into detail. Otherwise, it will be they be away from the main topic and there are some students who doesn't have that background. So, so basically we sometimes want to dope the source and drain with the P-type or N-type dopants to make them uh, conductive, okay? For, uh, for otherwise they will not work, okay? But then again, you know, to really understand it, we have to a little bit uh, know the device physics, like why we really want to make them um, P-type or N-type, uh, but let's not go there. So, but basically we want to make them P-type or N-type and for that, we can actually bombard ions with the ion beam lithography, right? So you can bombard ions on the whole surface. And you really don't have to really focus in this case because if you bombard ions on the surface, then the ions will only go through the areas which are open, right, in this area. So the ions will come and uh, will be deposited in this region. And based on how much energy you are using for the ions, like how much acceleration they're hitting the surface, they will, can go deeper or less deeper based on how much energy, how much energetic those are. <clears throat> so basically we bombard them with the ions. So the ions will be deposited. In this case is a P plus. Okay, so P plus means we are using a P type dopant here. And can you name one P type dopant? Anyone? P-type dopants? Yeah, we went through it, right? In the second lecture. What? Boron. boron. Yeah. So P-type dopants are boron. So you remember boron is from which group? Group 3. Boron is from group 3. And do you know any N-type dopant? Phosphorus, group 5. Okay, <coughs> excuse me, arsenic is also I think from group 5 that is also commonly used as a dopant. <clears throat> and silicon is from group 4, that's why it's a semiconductor. So we dope it with a uh, p-type impurity, in this case let's say boron, um, and uh, then you have um, this source uh, region ready. Then you can remove also silicon dioxide if you want to. So in that way, we have made actually a certain region which can be really, really small, which has a different electrical properties than the substrate. Okay, so you doped it. And and this is a this is what is done when you make a transistors or you build diodes. Okay. That's how they make a source and drain regions on the surface. And then they also then define a gate region, then connect it with the electrodes to make the whole transistor. Okay, let's talk about etching now a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, there are two types of etching. Um, one is the dry, and uh, the other one is a wet etching. So in dry etching, uh, what we normally do is we have to generate a plasma. Okay, so you know what plasma is? Plasma is what? Fourth state of matter. Fourth state of matter. Fourth state of matter. Okay, but what exactly it is? Uh, gaseous form. Ionized form. Yeah, ionized form of gases is called plasma. So when the gases are present, let's say oh, we have a lot of O2 here, right? And that's how that's how we can respirate. We can inhale, right? Uh, oxygen and we survive. Uh, but oxygen in this case is present in molecular form, uh, O2. So that's not reactive because uh, it's an external 
Uh, oxygen has six electrons, right? So it uh, shares electrons with the neighbor uh, two, and then it makes a covalent bond with other oxygen, so it makes O2. So O2 then is a stable. It doesn't react uh, with the um, with the organic organics like we are also carbon-based or organic. But now think about if oxygen is present as a single atomic form, okay, O with the valency of minus two, it will be very reactive. So in order to make gases reactive, we have to actually provide them enough energy. It, energy can be in the form of a heat, or it can be in the form of electromagnetic energy, so or radio frequency energy. So we provide energy in a small chamber and that actually breaks those uh, covalent bonds and makes a single atomic uh, oxygen, for example, in this case, and then it will be very reactive. <clears throat> so if we take uh, any wafer, um, which has some dust particles or organic depositions, or it can have a polymer, which is also carbon-based, and you put it in a furnace, like small furnace, and nothing will happen actually. The oxygen will not react with the surface of polymer because it's not reactive in the O2 form. Now, if we now generate a plasma by providing a high uh, energy focus with the radio frequency energy transfer or a heating, if you actually provide a high energy, then the oxygen <coughs> will dissociate into the oxygen atoms, and then it will start reacting with anything which comes into its uh, <coughs> way. And mostly if it is a carbon-based, uh, any organic material, uh, then it makes a carbon dioxide, and then it takes start removing that material from the surface. So let's say if your surface has some organic material on the surface, uh, some dust particles or something, you can put it in a uh, silicon. Um, oxygen furnace, you can turn on the plasma and after a few minutes you will see that uh, it will clean the surface. It will etch away the small um, uh, dust particles or if there is any organic material on the surface. This is how people also clean a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, wafers when they do the processing. So it's very commonly used for cleaning method with the oxygen plasma. Okay, so, so <clears throat> we can also use sometimes the oxygen Sometimes a gas doesn't react very well uh, with the material which you want to etch. So for that we also sometimes use the uh, ions, okay, like a gallium ions, argon ions. So they are heavy, noble gases, but you again in the plasma form they also become the atomic uh, uh, form. They come converted into atomic form and then they start uh, also reactive. So what you does is in that case, if you, this is a wafer, you apply the Let's say your ions are positively charged, then you apply a negative terminal or negative electrode is connected with your or ground with your uh, wafer, and then you apply a very high potential, a uh, few thousand uh, kilovolts, for example, very localized, so that those ions will come and hit with the surface with the high acceleration as you are doing the ion implantation previously. So those ions will come and hit the surface, and they can actually etch your materials from the surface, which are harder to etch. Okay, so ions can also be used for that matter uh, in these uh, uh, reactions. Uh, this is a one cartoon which shows okay how it works. So basically, you can have a wafer here. In this case, uh, you generate a plasma uh, with the. This is a plasma which makes the gases reactive, and then uh, itself, if you don't use an ion, those gases can come and react with your wafer, or you can actually apply some potential between uh, between your wafer substrate and the ch chamber, which will accelerate the ions based on their charge. If they're negative or positive, you have to apply different potential here. They will be uh, rushed, they will be accelerated towards your wafer, and they can they hit the wafer and they can remove certain material. They have a specificity also, like some materials are easy to remove, some are difficult to remove. So in that way, wafer can be etched. In general, oxygen is very commonly used uh, etchant. Fluorocarbons like CF4, CF3, C2F2, those are commonly used gases. And there are some, some other gases, um, basically it's based on either colorine, most of the etchants, or fullerene. You know why? You, because colorine is very reactive, group 7. Chlorine and fluorine, they also group seven. They are very, very reactive. So, so most of these gases which are used for dry etching, they are either chlorine-based um, 
or fullerene based so uh, in a fullerene based is a cf4 is very commonly used cf cf3 c2 f2 and uh, c3 f also i think in an ionic form so these are some of the gases which are used uh, for etching silicon silicon dioxide and all that and there's a table here which shows a uh, chf3 and um, sorry chf3 ch2 f2 um, so if you look at all all of these chemistries you will see this is c sf6 right so this is a fullerene based uh, this is CCLF3, it also has a fullerene and colorine. Uh, we also have a CCL, it's also colorine based. CF4, like freon 14, we call this freon 14. CF4 is also fullerene based. So most of the colorine are fullerene based. And this table shows their uh, specificity, uh, how they etch different materials. Uh, for example, let's look at any of those. For example, if we use oxygen, because we discussed oxygen briefly, so let's look at the oxygen. Um, O2, 51, SCCM. SCCM is a uh, unit for, I, I forgot the full name, but uh, it's a unit for uh, uh, airflow. So how much uh, gas you want to pump into the furnace, that's defined by SCCM. 50 watts is the power which you are actually providing to the uh, chambered so that the uh, ions can come and hit the surface. 50 kilohertz is actually the uh, radio frequency which you're applying uh, to the uh, chamber to, uh, uh, to make sure that you have a plasma generation. 300 millitor is the chamber pressure. So you normally do it at a low pressure and high vacuum to make sure that there is no dust particle or no other gases are there because they can contaminate your vapor surface. And uh, this is their selectivity. If it's a silicon or silicon carbide, it doesn't react with that. If it's polysilicon, it doesn't react with that. If it's silicon dioxide, it doesn't react with that. If it's silicon nitride, it doesn't react with that. If it's aluminum, it doesn't react with that. So it's very, very specific. It reacts with photoresist because it's a polymer and 350 nanometer I believe 350 nanometer no 350 angstroms per minute so basically 35 nanometer per minute so if you have a photoresist which is um, let's say 100 nanometer thick so you can do the oxygen plasma these conditions for three minutes so it should remove the photoresist from those areas where which are not covered with some other material but it will not do anything to either aluminum or silicon dioxide silicon hydride silicon so which is very selective which is good and in the same way we can have other gases let's say uh, now we want to add silicon dioxide for example so if we look at this table so this is what, what where it is showing a high selectivity, um, high etching rate for silicon dioxide. So let's look at that. So it's a CF4, CHF3 plus helium as a, these are used as the ion. So combination of different gases, uh, 450 watt power, 13.56 mega uh, radio frequency used to uh, generate plasma, 2.8 torrent gap is 0 0.38. That's a gap between the uh, wafer and your uh, uh, chamber height. How much high is the chamber? 38.38 centimeter. And uh, test not performed, but non to work. So I think we don't have numbers here, but I think in literature we can find those numbers. Um, in polysilicon, it etches like 140 to 190 nanometer per minute. Silicon dioxide, it etches 240 to 480 nanometer per minute. It also etches silicon nitride 190 nanometer, or it's four resistor. So it's not selective actually. So this one is not selective. So it is etching actually every everything which comes into uh, its way. But there are some methods how you can make CF4 based surface chemistry also selective. You can mix oxygen, for example, or hydrogen. Then to then it makes selective. It etches silicon, not silicon dioxide, or other way around based on how much you mix those two gases. But still, it shows uh, some non-specificity. So the dry etching is normally not very, very selective. Uh, some gases are, for example, oxygen, but other CF4, because if fullerene is very reactive, whatever comes into its way, it reacts with it. 
with a little bit more uh, reaction or less reaction, but it reacts with most of the materials, uh, silicon-based materials. So uh, from that perspective, it's not really a selective <coughs> method. The wet etching is in general very selective because it's a chemical etching, so we don't make ions uh, with the energy. So it's just a chemical, like HF for example, it reacts with the silicon dioxide with a certain chemical reaction, not with the silicon for example. So those are, and there are some uh, uh, gold etchants also, which are used for different applications. Um, I don't know, the one which you know you might have seen in the mall when you have a gold jewelry and uh, after some time its colors start getting a little bit darker or less fresh. So then we also have uh, gold etchants which are available uh, commercially and also you can take it to any jeweler, they can do it for you maybe a little bit charge. So they actually put their gold jewelry inside a small, I have seen that happening, so that's how I remember it. And it's some liquid, and that liquid most probably it should have some etchant which can remove uh, just some dust from the surface, and also maybe a very, very thin layer of very diluted etchant of for, uh, for gold, maybe very thin layer of gold also from the surface to make things new. Uh, so yeah, those um, and but it has to be very selective in that case, and also it should not etch a lot. Maybe maybe one atomic layer or two atomic layers because if it's more uh, vigorous reaction then uh, maybe you will not find your jewelry back. So then you will not be happy. So but anyways, uh, let's move on to dry etchings. Let's say if we use a SF4, so basically it's a free uh, fullerene uh, radicals which are responsible for etching in that case. Um, in this case, we are not using any ions. We can uh, use or cannot use ions based on the application. If we just use the fullerene as a gas, then uh, it's isotropic. It makes isotropic profiles. When we say isotropic, there are two kinds of etching. One is wet and dry, but there are also two other types of etching processes. One is called isotropic and one is called anisotropic. So isotropic, iso means similar. Tropics, it means it etches away all directions similarly. So let's say if you have a small area which you want to etch, but it etches also vertically and horizontally. So you'll, you'll not see a vertical feature afterwards. You will see a bowl-like features because it's uh, isotropic. So everywhere it etches similarly, which is sometimes not good actually. Because if you make a some features which you want them to be confined certain area, but when you do etching, they start getting rounded, and and you start um, seeing etching on the sides. So your overall feature size increases, right? Which you don't want uh, in many many uh, places. Um, and then uh, there's, but there are other etchants sometimes which are anisotropic. So anisotropic. Uh, which actually etches in certain direction more specifically, not the other directions. So let me ask you a question. If we use ion bombardment to etch materials, okay, ions to etch materials, do you expect anisotropic etching or isotropic etching? Yeah, if we use ions, to bombard on the surface and etch a material, right? Uh, then do you expect isotropic etching? Means would the material will be etched away in horizontal vertical direction similarly, or it will be anisotropic etching where the material will be etched away in one direction more specifically? Anisotropic, yes. So because you are now really accelerating those ions with a high potential difference, and they really hit the surface and bombard it on the surface, not really going in the other direction. You might see some deflection to the other directions, but, but not a lot of deflection. So you, if you really want to make features which are vertical, I would go with the dry etching processes. But if you really want to be more selective, I would most probably go with the wet etching. Uh, but then in wet etching, again, you have, because the chemical reaction base, so you actually have a more round etching in that case. Okay, so then it really depends what kind of features, what you really want to do with your stuff, 
and what materials you have. So based on that, we can decide, okay, maybe what may be a best option. Uh, but in general, these are general guidelines. So wet etchings are more selective, dry etchings are less selective. Many use, use gases, especially Freon. Um, it's a CF4 based surface chemistry. You know it's a CF4. So it has a fullerene. When it becomes uh, ionized, so it has a carbon also and fullerene. So fullerene will go and react with the surface. What, what's about the carbon? If we use oxygen inside with the mixture, then yes, maybe carbon will react with the oxygen, it'll make a carbon dioxide, which is volatile and can be exhausted outside. But if we don't use oxygen in this case, so what will happen? The carbon will start depositing inside the chamber. And, and then it will also deposit on your wafer. So when you take your wafer out, you will see that whole, the wafer is fully covered with the carbon or base polymer material. So, and I've seen that happening a lot, actually. When you use a, a CF4 or CHF3 base surface chemistry where you have a carbon also there, um, then, then, then you see a polymer deposition a lot. Okay, and that polymer deposition, if it's not, now let's think about it. If you have CF4 only, you're etching silicon dioxide, and now you will see some carbon deposition, and after some time you will see a full layer of carbon on the surface, and what will happen with the etching then? Does CF4 etch away carbon? Maybe yes, to some extent. But again, it will inhibit the etching process after some time when you have a thick layer of a carbon on the surface. But if you have oxygen there with the CF4, then oxygen actually reacts with the carbon, it can take off the carbon. So. Uh, with the freon base, this is very common. And the problem is that you can use oxygen, but you never know the person if it is a common facility where people are using uh, one equipment for a lot of different applications, mostly in the academia environment or R&D environment. They test it with different materials and chemicals. So let's uh, take example. If you come, you look at, okay, you reserve the equipment online, you went to the equipment, you open it, you put your wafer, you close it, you okay decided okay what gas do you want to use you turn on the system for 10 minutes after that you see it that your surface is full with the carbon although you didn't use cf you didn't use cf4 why because there was already carbon deposition inside the feed gas lines the chamber is connected with the uh, gases right so there was some carbon deposition there also and and that carbon will come and will deposit on this your surface so and, and, and you might have a very expensive, and you might have spent a lot of effort in actually making that wafer. Now it's not useful. So it is very recommended that whenever you use these etching equipment, especially in the environment where other people also use it, um, then you should first turn on the system, run it for 10 minutes with the oxygen plasma only. That'll make sure if there is any carbon, uh, that will be etched away in the feed gases, it will be etched away. In and it will not fall on the surface. Then open the chamber, look at the chamber, see if there is any anything deposited on the chamber itself. If you see a deposition, it means the furnace is not clean. So you have to maybe run it for 30 minutes or one hour on oxygen plasma. And uh, it has to be clean before you put your wafer, otherwise it will not be useful. The other type of etching is, you know, the wet etching, which is very straightforward. Uh, most commonly materials which are used for, uh, which is which are etched away with the etch, etch, uh, wet etching is the silicon, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride. Um, you can etch gold, you can etch silver, you can etch aluminum, you can etch almost most of the materials with the, <clears throat> few are not etched very well, but yeah, we have uh, etchants for these materials. But in this case, we have um, the etching profile looks more like this. So let's say if we're etching on this area, then you also see etching on the, on the, um, side direction on the sides or horizontal direction so your features are more round up at the end so some of the most commonly used uh, etchants uh, just as example uh, are like acidic nitric phosphoric acid for aluminum for example nitric acid can be used for copper you know hydrofluoric also known as buffered hydrofluoric or buffered oxide etch all names are for hydrochloric acid, for silicon dioxide, right? That's what we know already. Phosphoric acid for silicon nitride, and uh, you can use uh, potassium iodide on iodide 2, H2O mixture at this concentration for gold. 
and in that way you can find also recipes for other materials to be etched away <coughs> you can find chemicals in wet etching um, there is one important uh, types of etchants which are anisotropic in general the wet etching is also isotropic these are isotropic etchants which etch all different directions but there are some etchants actually which etch the material in a very specific direction and they are called the anisotropic and they are actually chemicals uh, one of those chemicals are potassium hydroxide for example KOH potassium hydroxide it etches away very specifically in certain crystal directions for example if we have this opening and you and you want to etch that opening and you put this material in a potassium hydroxide so what and potassium hydroxide etches silicon so it start etching in this direction so it etches way like a triangle you will see your feature will be like this at the end do you see that it's a pyramid shape in reverse of a pyramid <coughs> right let's look at the other form see in this case so this is the etching is going through the opening and etching silicon by it's etching at certain angle and like you can also this is side view so it's etching at certain angle and then you will at the end you will get um, <clears throat> this kind of a feature if you start with a small window then you ended up the window will close somewhere in the middle right so it's called the pyramid shape you can use the potassium hydroxide um, or potassium uh, or, or uh, tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide also we call it as a TMAH those are two commonly used anisotropic etchants for silicon okay now the question is why do we see that kind of a structure why it etches in that kind of a direction because it, it etches actually in certain crystal directions it has a more etching rate as compared to uh, atoms which are in other crystal direction so in this case the wet etchant if we use KOH it etches this is a 100 direction okay so if from the top to bottom is a 100 direction so it etches actually more in 100 direction and on the sides is actually 111 direction so it etches more at 100 direction and etches less on the sides which is 111 so in that way then you will see more deeper but then from the sides you, you will have less etchant uh, let less etching rate and then you will see that the window is closing after some time <clears throat> in general the if you use a TMH it etches about 0.6 micrometer per minute um, in one zero zero direction and it only etches 0 0.027 micrometer in the on the side so 0 0.02 like 1000 times less than uh, then in one other direction so it's anisotropic so it's very directional oriented okay low battery let me just put my charger You know the angle because it always etches almost similarly, etches downwards at let's say 0.6 micrometer per minute or 600 nanometer per minute or 0.6 micrometer per minute with a very high etching rate, and on the sides etches 0 0.27, 0 0.027 micrometer per minute. So you will get very defined shape always, and there is one characteristic of this shape that you will always get this angle close to 54.7 degree centigrade uh, not centigrade degrees only so this angle is always about 54.7 if it's a silicon <coughs> okay so let me show you so this is a, another table which shows how the TMH etches in one direction or other <coughs> let's look at Okay, TMH 20% and 79.8 degrees centigrade. 
Okay, so the, it definitely if you change the temperature, it will have a different etching rate. So at these conditions, if you are in a one zero zero direction, you will see that its etching rate is 0 .0, 0 0.6 micrometer per minute, right? As what I was saying. At one 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 direction, which is this one, right, is 0 0.0. 1, 7, I was saying 0 0.02, so it's actually 0 0.01 at 1, 1, 1 direction, which is on the side. And uh, <clears throat> then the ratio between 1, 1, 0 and, and the uh, 1, 1, 1 and 1, 1, 0 is actually 37 times, so you get a more Actually, not 1,000, it's a 137 if you do the math, 0 0.6 divided by 0 0.01. Uh, can you do that? 0 0.6, 0 0.03. Do anyone, you have a calculator? Point, um, uh, 0 0.603 divided by 0 0.017. 35.4. 35.47, so uh, yeah, it's, it looks like a rounded number, so we are getting close to 37. In the case of TMH, which is another agent which is used, it has a selective, it has a orientation or direction about 74 times more in the 100 direction than 111. So, <clears throat> okay, so, and you can then uh, look at different directions. So based on which direction you are looking at, orientation of the atoms, it will have different etching rates. Uh, so in wet etching, and especially in, in astrotropic etching, there are different etchants which are available. So potassium hydroxide is commonly used and tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide TMH is more commonly used. There are other etchants also, but they are more toxic. I have mostly seen potassium hydroxide and uh, TMH you, being used for most of the applications. And out of these two, actually TMH is a better option because you don't have a potassium there, potassium ion, and if, especially if you're working with electronic components, then uh, the potassium is a fast diffuser. It can diffuse very quickly inside a silicon, silicon dioxide. So we try a wide potassium. But if uh, you are not concerned with the electrical properties, then you can use a potassium hydroxide or TMH. So both works very well. Uh, then <clears throat> in anisotropic etching, if we look at these uh, graphs, you will see that when we increase the concentration, of the um, base or of the etchant, you will see that the etching rate normally, let's look at the one, zero, zero. So increasing the concentration, etching rate actually start getting lower and lower. So we normally first it increases a little bit, uh, and then about at 25%, right? It has a maximum etching rate, and then it start falling down because of saturation. Then, uh, in the case of TMH, also when we increase the concentration, you will see that from 10 to onwards, where is one zero zero. So one zero zero direction, it stays almost constant and then start falling down. So that's why we normally pick 20% from here. We can use 20% to make sure that we have a max good etching rate. And in this case, we can choose maybe 25. We, we have a good etching rate in one zero zero direction. And it also shows that the temperature effects. So in general, uh, when you use a high temperature, so this is the, these are the etching temperatures. So it goes this way is higher because uh, k, k inverse. So we, this uh, graph is shown as a, in a reverse direction. So you have a more high temperature on this side. So when you use a high temperature, your etching rate actually move uh, goes high. And also in the TMH, if you increase a high temperature, your etching rate actually increases. So so in general. <coughs> With the high temperature, your etching rate increases, and uh, with the increasing concentration, it can go increase or it can decrease based on what concentration you're using. So based on that, we pick up the values. Normally 20%, 90 degrees is a very commonly used uh, conditions for TMH and QH, both of them. <clears throat> okay, so in wet etching, um, this is a summary of what we kind of discussed. Um, the wet etching can be isotropic and anisotropic. Can you name any anisotropic wet etching? 
can you name any of the anisotropic wet etchant? KOH. KOH, yes. And TMAH, yeah, they both are anisotropic. Uh, applications uh, isotropic when it's etches all the way we can make spheres domes grooms grooves in isotropic we can make angled nozzles diaphragms cantilevers bridges we'll see one example today hopefully if we time get a time that where it can use to make some structures with uh, some bio applications more specifically so it has a high etching specificity etching and isotropic etching at a one micrometer in on one this direction and then then uh, in the other direction is uh, is less etching rate. Um, isotroping uh, depends on what kind of uh, uh, chemical you're using. So it can actually go very high, especially in hydrofluoric, for example, it's also one micrometer per minute. Uh, it can be even higher, five, uh, 50 micrometer per minute uh, if you use some, uh, for some cases. So, so, So that's not important. So it's not a good number, it's a variable. It depends what kind of uh, etchant you're using. <coughs> so isotropic, okay, a little control, simple, okay, that's not important. So let's look at uh, some of the images online. Let's see. Uh, <coughs> Oh, these are real features which you can made on the surface. So these are real SEM images. So someone has made this structure. I don't know for what purpose, but yes, you can do many things with that. See, it really depends what you, and it's very specific. You always get this pyramid shape. For example, if you want this kind of a structure, you can make it with the uh, potassium hydroxide. It's very, very commonly used. I used it one time for making a nanopores. This is one technology which is used for DNA analysis. And uh, what I will do is today, uh, let me do it right now, before I forget about it. Um, I already uploaded actually, uh, a paper, which is a nanomechanical motion of uh, E. coli on the cantilever. You should go through that paper, okay? I, the, on the canvas, and let me upload one more paper. Okay, this is a shrinking of solid state nanopores with a direct thermal heating. So you will go through this paper and that paper, both papers, just read it, okay? I will not ask anything from the paper, but it's just for your understanding where we are using these methods. So if I look at, let's say, <clears throat> just want to show you this is one of my old papers um, shrinking off salts and nanopores but direct thermal heating and you will see we have used this wet etching TMH etching to make nanopores and look at this pore size this is about 200 nanometer and let me show you more so we have made pores of 5 nanometer and this is a TM image See, look at the pore size, how small it is. Pore means like small opening, and that is used for some application. But the whole idea which I want to show you is that uh, you can use the TMH etching process as one example to make the pores which are used for uh, DNA analysis. Uh, it finds that, and nanopores are very, now, very new technology. People are looking at, working on to improving the methods and all that, so, but this is one of the approach by using uh, uh, thermal shrinking to shrink the particle. So you will go through it, hopefully, by yourself and uh, uh, learn learn more details from there by yourself. It's easy. Okay, so let's look at this example. <clears throat> So can we design a recipe? Let's say I, I, I'll give you some numbers, okay? So let's say this is a downward is a one zero zero direction, 
and the we are using a TMAH uh, and uh, it's a 20% and we are using a temperature which is 90 degree. I will give you just uh, the etching rates, okay? So you don't have to really look at the table. So in one zero zero direction, which is from top to bottom, the etching rate is uh, 0 0.6 micrometer per minute, okay? And by the way, there will be one question in the exam, midterm or final, regarding this structure, the TMH, I'm telling you right now. It will be asked one way or other way, so just remember that this is important to understand, okay, for an exam point of view also. Then on the side, the etching rate is 0 0.027 micrometer per minute. On the side, which is one, one, one direction, this direction and that direction is a 0 0.027 micrometer per minute. And this angle is how much? 54.7 degrees. Okay, and this dimension is given to you, which is 450 nanometer, uh, 450 micrometer, and this dimension is also given to you. You know from where these dimensions come into play? When you look at the structure, how it's etched away, you have always how much etching you want, this 450, and then how much is the window? So this window, actually, if you look at from the top, there will be a window here, right? This window is here because it's etching all four directions. If you etch it, long, etch it longer, then it will close. But you keep closing, right? At the start, you have a larger window, then it keep closing, closing. So that window, right, that's what is being shown here to be, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 350 micrometer, right, wide, and 350 micrometer on that direction. So it will be a square window. <coughs> Okay, now watch the question. In order to have this kind of a structure in silicon, this is silicon material because the TMH etches silicon. In order to have this kind of structure in silicon, because this is what you want, you want this window um, to this much deep, and at the end you will have this much of a width. Okay, uh, you will have this much of window, 350 micrometer by 350 micrometer, and and there we'll talk about one example. If one, once you read a um, uh, the so, nanopore paper which I uploaded, you will understand, okay, why we are doing it. It can find tons of different applications. So, can we calculate how much should be our starting window? This is a design problem. So, this is what you want actually at the end of a process with those etching rates. Then, how much would be the starting window on your wafer or mask for example like how much this opening should be if this opening is very small for example uh, 100 and 100 micrometer right so then it will close somewhere very nearby it will not go so deep deep so one thing is for sure that it should be large window actually not 100 micron not 120 so it should be large but is there a way to calculate that there may be some way this is a geometry problem trigonometry Okay, so can you think about it a little bit for a minute? Yeah, we have the angle. We have the angle. And then? That's it. That's it, okay. Okay, you will calculate, okay, by yourself. I will leave you guys to do it. Let's do it now. Let's calculate how much exactly. In trigonometry, just make sure that we use it we have a tan theta we have a sine theta right cos theta also so maybe one of that feature uh, formula you can use it
okay i'll let you guys think about it okay and uh, next class the start will do it i want you to actually do it at home maybe and next time when i'll see you next week i will go through you with you again and you will then reconfirm whether your answer was correct or not <coughs> this is not a homework for grading it's just for practice okay because there will be something coming up in the exam for sure regarding this so it's better to do it and understand it <clears throat> it's not difficult but uh, you, can, you can also take help from online literature and see how people did calculate all those things but basically if you this is a theta right i give you just one hint tan of theta tangent of theta is equal to perpendicular over base so you have to use that formula somewhere and calculate how much should be the starting window <coughs> rest i will leave you leave it on you <clears throat> okay there are just a couple of more slides uh, before i cover those slides let's look at um, one more example i have also uploaded this paper by the way it's i think published in 2014 in a applied fixed letters so in this paper they use uh, uh, bad etching to make this cantilever so this is a hanging structure you can use a bad etching so how let's say if i if I design my mask such that this structure stays covered with the photoresist, for example, and then I also cover this structure with the silicon dioxide, and then I open up this uh, some windows from the, on this side and that side. So what happens with the etching, right? It etches this way. With the etching, it will etch away all the all the silicon, also under it. And only this cantilever will be left, which will not be etched away with the KOH, which is made up of silicon dioxide or silicon nitride. So you can make this hanging, hanging structure. So in this paper, which you will go through, uh, this is also how AFM works, by the way. So then they also have a laser, which is pointing actually on the tip of this uh, cantilever. And then you also have a sensor. So whenever the tip is banded, if it, the tip is mechanically bent, if there is something attached, uh, because the you look at the size, so based on this scale, looks like this tip width would be about 10 micrometer, uh, <clears throat> approximately, which is uh, five times thinner than our hair, and the length is about I think looks like 100 micrometer. You can get the exact numbers from the paper itself which is I up uploaded in a canvas, so you should read that. <clears throat> so what they have seen that with this one, if something like cell, one cell, which is 10 micron diameter, will come and sit on the surface, it will bend. Because it's a flexible material. Silicon dioxide is also flexible when it is very thin. So what they have done, they have seen that when they have, this is CFU, colonial forming units, per ml, it means these many equal eyes, if they put, uh, how much was it? 10 is for what? Like 6? 10 is for 7 or 10 is for 8 equali per ml and you put it and then definitely they have attached some antibodies on the surface so that they can come and bind with it. So once the equali actually bound on the surface of a cantilever it start bending and when it bends then they use a laser and the diode uh, to uh, the imaging system to actually <coughs> see that bending so because if, if it is bending a little bit, then your reflection will be a different angle. And if it is bending less, your reflection will be a different place. So from there, you estimate, okay, how much is being deflected. Uh, and they have...